This is part two of the real deal. We did a real deal actually where we went out to the property on Gibson. This house, 22207 North Gibson Drive. YouTube doesn't want us saying addresses, so hopefully YouTube, please don't kick us off of YouTube, okay? So this is a house that we own. We just closed escrow on it about four days ago, so this is really recent. And I wanna walk through and have a conversation about the numbers so you guys understand where did the deal come from? How did we get the deal? These are really important things when you're just starting out, you wanna know. So how did we get the deal? We got the deal from texting, okay? Texting the seller. Okay, well, what does that mean? What were we texting? What was that like? How did we know to text him? Where did we get his number? Well, we texted the seller from a foreclosure list, okay? So where do you get foreclosure lists? Is we get them from batchleads.io forward slash pace if you guys want a discount, boom. We go to batchleads.io, we download all the foreclosures and people that are in foreclosure in our local market. We then send them a text message asking them if they're looking to sell their house and we follow up. This follow up took about two months. If you guys wanna know about scripting and what we script, make a comment down below and maybe I'll make a video of like what exactly do we type to people and how do we get a hold of them. So we texted them utilizing batchleads.io. We literally texted them through the platform. So Batchleads not only allows you to get the data of who is in foreclosure, but they also allow you to text through their platform. So the seller was in foreclosure. He lost his job, okay? That was his main pain. He lost his job, couldn't make his house payment, so he fell behind on his payments, which then put him into foreclosure. Foreclosure is public data, so we can see that on websites. I can go right now on Zillow and I could say, Zillow, show me all the foreclosures and it'll show me everybody that's in foreclosure. So it's not a secret where you can find foreclosure data. Batch Leads is just the best for us. So this gentleman had lost his job. He was a trucker, couldn't afford his payment anymore. And we offered to give him some money and take over his payments and catch up his arrear. So first thing that we did is this is what it cost to get into the deal. The house owed about $180,000. And the mortgage, we bought this house subject to, which means this $180,000, I didn't have to pay off. Kind of crazy. People think you can't buy a house unless you pay off the other debt. And the reality is that's not true. Subject two allows me to just make payments towards that 180 and I have the deed in my name. In fact, I'd be curious. This house right now on Gibson, there's a bank that is owed money still in the seller's name. I'd be curious if I went to Assessor's website? Yeah, you'd go to Maricopa County Assessor. So let's go to the Assessor. Let's Google that. Boom. Okay. Maricopa County Assessor's office. If I type in the address, 07 North Gibson, I'd be curious to see if it actually pulls up fast enough. Oh, you know why? Because it's not Maricopa. It's the city of Maricopa but it's not in the county of Maricopa, it's in Pinal County. That's amazing. Is it Pinal County down there? What is that down there? Pinal County parcel search. Cool. So it's pretty easy guys. Owner's name, property address, number 22207. It's north, right? Gibson. Okay, so this is the previous owner. Primary owner shows Carol Cornell. So it hasn't, even though we've recorded at the county, the county sometimes takes a couple of days to index. Okay, so index means that right now it shows that Carol Cornell, the previous owner, is the current owner, but we've already done the paperwork to transfer it and it just takes a couple of days. I was curious to see because you can see we closed escrow just a couple of days ago. I was curious to see if the county assessor's website was like super fast, but sometimes that takes like, 10 to 14 business days to index or catch up on the website. So something to think about. It's crazy all the things you learn in this business, you know, all these little doohickeys and whatnot. Okay, so the house, he owed $180,000. That's what he owed on the mortgage. The problem is he owed $20,000 in arrears. So that's late payments. We gave him another, let's say miscellaneous $20,000. That's HOA was owed. We gave Carol or Mr. Cornell, we gave Mr. Cornell some cash and then we paid another about uh, $14,000 or so. I'm sorry, $24,000 in other miscellaneous things. Like we helped him get into an apartment. We paid for moving expenses. We got him pizza and some Diet Coke and we got some other things for him. Literally, yes, we literally did. And our total purchase price plus closing costs, right? So $3,000 in closing costs turned out to be $247,000. This money 
I had to go and get. So this money I had to get, I had to get this money, I had to get this money, I had to get this money. This was money I had to bring to the table. This $180,000 I did not because I bought this subject too, the 180,000. So I didn't have to come up with the money for that, which is nice. Where did I come up with the money for this other month? This other chunk is a private money lender. If you guys wanna learn how to raise private money and where that money comes from, type in YouTube, Pace Morby private money. Okay, and I have like 15 or 20 videos on just that topic. It'll teach you a ton of stuff. So I got a private money lender, just an individual that gave us the $67,000 to catch all that up. As you can see, this property is, uh, what's owed is 247, that's what I bought it for. And the Zestimate is 370. So the question you gotta ask yourself is, do you A, do you flip it? Or B, do you hold it? And this is always a common question, like when you do a, a sub two deal like this, it's like, if I flip it, you can see that, Z that Zillow says they think it's worth 370. I wonder if I can draw on this. How do I draw on this? That's what I really wanna do with my life. You know what I'm saying? How do I do that? Are you kidding me? That's what I'm talking about. Boom. That's dope. The vibe board is sick, guys. If you, I'm gonna put a link to the vibe board down in the description if you guys wanna get one of these things. They're, they're super sick. I'm still learning cool things about it. Okay, so you can see the Zestimate, what we could sell it for is at 370. So if you go back over here, if we're into it 247 and we go and sell it for 370, the difference between that is about $123,000. That's a pretty good spread, but that's not your net profit, okay? Your net profit on $123,000 spread is you've gotta take out $30,000 in commissions to agents to sell the property for you. And we probably have to put about $15,000 into the property. So 123 subtract 45, it looks like we'd make about 77 to $78,000 net. I was originally thinking that this house would make a hundred grand, but it's, it looks like it's not gonna make a hundred grand. It looks like it's gonna be make around 77 to $78,000. So if I have a question about this quick math I just went through, please make a comment down below. Now in the hold section, this is interesting because this property normally does not cash flow, it breaks even. As as you can see right here, the payment on this property is about $1,400. The good thing is I could rent it for $1,900. So you'd have a gross cash flow uh, of $500 every single month. The problem is, Eric, what are, we not, what are we not remembering here? Who else do I owe money to besides just the bank? The private money lender. So the private money lenders, you guys remember, up here I borrowed $67,000 from that person to catch up the arrears, get the cash to the seller, you know, pay for closing costs, all those types of things. This person says, hey Pace, I'm not gonna just lend $67,000 to you without a payment. And so our lenders lend us about 10%. So what's 10% of $67,000 divided by 12, right? Because you got monthly payments. So the payment to this guy is $558 per month. That's not good. Because if you're down here and your cash flow was 500, now your private money lender takes 558, this deal doesn't cash flow. In fact, you lose $58 and that's before maintenance, vacancy, other little repairs, legal fees, all that kind of stuff that you would run into in the future because tenants kind of suck. You're gonna lose money. However, if you turn this into a sober living, I don't think it's an Airbnb neighborhood. If you turn this into a sober living, this could rent out for $5,400 per month. Why? Why is that? Well, typically a sober living facility can get nine people per house before they have to go and get fire sprinklers and certain certifications and all that kind of stuff. They charge these people $600 per person to rent out a bed, not a room, a bed. They'll, a lot of times they'll put two, three people in the same room and just have like bunk beds and stuff like that because this is temporary. People come in, they come out. So at $5,400, Right now, fifty-four hundred dollars. You subtract your fourteen hundred dollar payment. You subtract your five fifty to your private money lender, and you subtract another, let's say, five hundred dollars for miscellaneous. Now, twenty-five hundred. We have something to write home about. We could make about twenty-nine hundred dollars a month in cash flow. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. If I have twenty-nine hundred dollars a month in net cash flow on this deal, how does my private money lender get paid back? Because my five fifty is interest only, right? They're getting $550 every single month interest only. So it's not paying down that $67,000. Well, what I do is I'll just pay that extra $2,900 every month towards my private money lender and chisel away that $67,000 until it's paid off. And now you own a property that has a lot of equity, has a ton of cash flow, and now that gets rid of that payment and you can move that private money lender to another deal. So $67,000 divided by 2,900, that looks like it would be 30, probably 34, 
four months, okay? I'm guessing it might be 33, okay? So in, a th in basically three year time frame of making this payment and collecting rent and paying down the mortgage and all that kind of stuff, you would have no private money lender. The private money lender be would be completely paid off. And that from that point forward, you wouldn't now have 2,900 in cash flow. You'd have 2,900 plus your 550 payment because you no longer have a private money lender. So you can make $3,400 every single month for the rest of your life. And then when the mortgage gets paid off, the 180 that we took over, when that 180 gets paid off, now you've got another $1,400 a month. Now you can truly make four, $5,000 every single month in cash flow. So which way would you go? Would you guys go with the fix and flip, make 70,000? Or would you go with the route of making cash flow for the rest of your life? Kind of depends on who you are, what resources you have, and ultimately what stage of the journey you're in. Make a comment below, I'm super curious, because we're gonna do a part three of this, and I wanna look down in the comments during part three and see how many people said keep it, and how many people said flip it. I don't know which way we're gonna go. We're gonna make that determination in the next couple of days, and then we'll make part three of wrapping it up and what the final numbers were. And so we'll see you guys in that video.